Hi, and welcome everyone to Dree's Note. Uh, I am not Dree's, I'm Heather Rocker, Executive Director of the Drupal Association. So before we get started with the Dree's Note, I've got a few things to share with you and then I'll kick it over and we'll continue and get to spend the next 90 minutes together. So I wanna start by saying thank you to the Quoni team, yay, and to my team at the Drupal Association, yay, for all your hard work to make DrupalCon happen. So if you need help hiring Drupal talent, finding a job in Drupal, connecting with the right Drupal partners, expanding the visibility of your brand, or even managing Drupal security releases more easily, we at the Drupal Association are here to empower your success. And I don't have a ton of time today to go through everything that we're doing, not even everything we're doing here at DrupalCon. So I've listed a few ways that you can connect with us hopefully this week at DrupalCon and also outside of this week. When in doubt, if you're not sure where to find us, you can always reach out at help at drupal.org for more information. Please find a way to connect with us if you haven't already, because we would certainly love to hear from you. So on behalf of the Drupal Association staff and board, I have the pleasure of giving Drupal thanks today. We're gonna to start with our event contributors, also known as event volunteers, but I find it's important to say event contributors because helping with events, whether they're local or global like DrupalCon, is a way to contribute to the Drupal project. So join me in taking a moment to recognize these DrupalCon contributors. You can also see their wonderful faces on the DrupalCon Europe website. And of course, events like these aren't possible without sponsors, so we'll take a moment to recognize those as well. So we have quite a few Diamond sponsors. Thank you so much. This would be an awesome time for me to have memorized the new Drupal song that LJ Rich sang on Monday and or to have learned to play the keyboard by now. But instead, we're going to look through slides and pretend there's a lovely Drupal song playing in the background. So I also wanna thank these individual supporters. So these are folks that not only bought a ticket to DrupalCon, but decided to donate above and beyond to support the event. And part of their support to the event is helping with our pool of scholarship funds. So thank you to the scholarship sponsors for sponsoring 62 scholarship recipients attending this week's DrupalCon Europe event. Drupal thanks also go out to our supporting partners. Funding from these organizations is critical in supporting all of the non-DrupalCon work that we do at the association as well. So thank you to all of these DrupalCon supporting partners. Many of you have been with the association as a supporting partner for years. Uh, over the past two years, some of you have even upped your level of giving. A lot of you are giving and contributing to the project and all of those things are so, so appreciated. So thank you for all of your support, for all the things that we do for Drupal. And thank you Drupal Association individual members. So if you don't happen to have a current membership, this is a great reminder to go get one or to renew your lapsed membership. Your membership, yes, is a way if you'd like to donate to the Drupal Association, but more than anything, it's a way for you to engage with us and for us to engage with you so we can make sure that you know all that's happening within the project, we can keep you updated on news and events, and we can help find the best ways to connect you for the best use of your talent within Drupal. So now we're gonna shift gears just a bit from gratitude to reflection. I was all set to walk you through the fastest possible tour of all the work that we've been doing at the Drupal Association and how it relates to the Drupal project. You know, I usually get somewhere between 10 and 15 minutes to do all the thank yous and to update you on all the things, and I had it all ready. And then something happened yesterday, and that changed everything we're about to talk about. It's nothing bad, it was actually something interesting. So it all started with a TV show that my son is fascinated by. And interestingly, he's never actually seen an episode of this show. He's just heard about it through pop culture. Uh, he watched a bit of the Emmy Awards recently, so he knows about the show enough to be interested. Well, he asked me last week to buy him some laptop stickers featuring the characters of the show, and those arrived in the mail yesterday. 
And that is where we begin. Since laptop stickers are basically the official currency of DrupalCon, I thought this would be a fun place to start. So the show is Ted Lasso, and it's an, about an American with a funny accent who shows up out of nowhere to lead a team overseas. Everyone was skeptical about whether or not this person could actually help the team win. And the funny part is, as I'm reading this, obviously, I'm seeing some similarities to my time when I arrived at Drupal in 2019. Yes, I have a funny Southern accent. Uh, it's not as bad as it could be. So as I started looking literally through this huge stack of Ted Lasso stickers, it hit me that many of the leadership lessons from the show were relevant to, and in fact, reflective of the work we do with Drupal. So I actually thought of all of you here at DrupalCon and beyond, and I wanted to reflect on where we are and where we can go with a little help from Ted. Be curious, not judgmental. So what are the tenants there? It's about asking questions, not underestimating people. And I wanna see who can type this the fastest in the chat. Finish the sentence, seek first to understand, because obviously it's one of our Drupal values and principles. So seek first to understand, then to be understood. As we go through, you'll notice that our Drupal values and principles are woven into the narrative. It's a really natural blend because Drupal has long been committed to many of these ideas. And last but not least, everyone has something to contribute. And because everyone has something to contribute, we wanna be sure those contributions of all types are recognized. And as seen here, you now have the ability to include more contribution types as part of our Drupal credit system. And for recognition, on your Drupal profile. Change can be scary. Embrace change. So whether it's a change in leadership, change in strategy, change in process, change can be uncomfortable. However, we celebrate our Drupal community's commitment to embracing change. After all, the drop is always moving to ensure that Drupal can keep innovating. And yes, change can be scary, but it can also create amazing things. So moving away from the custom built tools on Drupal.org, when we talked about this concept late last year, early this year, and I remember having this conversation with Dries, it, it was a scary thought of the magnitude of what that meant. But the upside means making it easier for you to contribute with a streamlined process especially for those coming to us from other projects. And we're always looking for ways to improve the tools, systems, incentives that enable more contribution. I'll admit the thought of trying to preserve Drupal's trailblazing contribution credit system as part of a move to GitLab is intimidating, but we can do it together and we'll likely pave the way for other projects to increase recognition for their contributors as well. I believe in hope. I believe in believe. So when Ted Lasso shows up as the coach of Richmond, one of the first things he does in season one is make a sign that says believe, and he tapes it to the door in the locker room, setting the stage for the team to know that we are capable of great things and we deserve the best possible outcome. Well, I think this applies to us within the Drupal community as well. Ted showed the team about their potential and I wanna make sure that all of you here understand the potential of both yourself and of our collective community. We are truly capable of great things and creating new points of access for people to join and contribute to Drupal is an important part of our work. This happens through initiatives like scholarships to DrupalCon, hosting mentor summits so that we're creating a larger pool of contribution mentors so that we can mentor a larger pool of new contributors. 
We also collaborate with organizations around the world to both advocate for Drupal and encourage new talent to join us. New access ramps to Drupal are also created through comprehensive training and mentorship programs like our first Drupal talent and education program, Discover Drupal, which launched earlier this year. This is a recent profile of one of our Discover Drupal students, and I thought you might like to see where the students are coming from, why they're interested in Drupal, but the thing to know is that when we put out the call for training organizations to help make this happen, we heard yes, and we heard it loudly. And when we put out the call to organizations and to individuals who might be interested in having a career in Drupal and having a way to get that started, the demand always outweighs our supply. So I hope that we can talk more about how we can collaborate as a community and fund initiatives to, to continue to grow and scale programs like this globally. We are laser focused on driving rapid innovation for Drupal, and we can do that by creating and supporting makers. If you're a contributor to any way to Drupal, you are a maker. So during the official opening ceremony for DrupalCon Europe on Monday, I asked the proud makers in the audience to let us know. So I'm gonna do that again. If you're a Drupal contributor in any way, shape or form, please type I'm a maker in the chat now. And this was my view from backstage on Monday when I asked who's ready to contribute but hasn't had the opportunity yet. I can't tell you how exciting it was to see the flood of I am ready that came through the feed. And that just proves it's not a lack of desire for people to contribute. We've got the energy and enthusiasm and talent. It's about making sure that all of you that want to contribute can do so effectively. For those of you that haven't contributed yet, you're simply a maker at the start of your Drupal journey. So if this is you, if you're ready and you're a maker at the start of your journey, please type I am ready in the chat now. And for all of you watching the chat, if you're makers, again, I encourage you, please connect with all of these wonderful people who are ready to contribute to Drupal. Make the connection this week, support each other, and let's do what we need to do, which is continue to expand the talent of our community and their ability to contribute to our wonderful project. It's also important to support maker organizations. We want to create a symbiotic relationship between organizations that value contribution to Drupal and individuals who want to contribute as part of their paid work. We need to make those systems work together. We need more organizations willing to hire people and letting them contribute as part of their paid work. So right now we work with organizations to support those that are committed to contributing to Drupal. We do that through new programs like Drupal Certified Partners, which you'll hear more about in the coming months. So far, approximately 25% of all Drupal supporting partner organizations have qualified for this program. You'll see this is a behind the scenes mock-up we did recently uh, of the new badges for our Drupal uh, certified partner organizations. Some of you may have seen these start to roll out on drupal.org. And if so, uh, let us know if you're interested, if your organization is not yet a certified partner, because we're also working with all interested organizations to help you learn more about contribution and how to get you connected to the opportunities that have the biggest impact on the project. So where do we go from here? I'd like to set a vision for our community of innovation. All things are possible because we believe in the power of Drupal's flexible, free, open source platform to make a positive impact in the world. All things are possible because we are diverse, inclusive, curious, and collaborative. All things are possible because we are Drupal makers and we are better together. Communities rather than individuals are the basic unit of, of sustained innovation. And in an ideal world, everyone using Drupal would be contributing back to it. 
If we can collectively align on these concepts and this approach to our work, we can then collaborate to cultivate the best use of your talent, each and every one of you, and recognize your contributions in a way that's meaningful to you. In turn, we can build careers and connect everyone that builds with and relies on Drupal with the resources, services, partners, and tools that you need to be successful. The Drupal Association is here as a partner and catalyst to make that happen. Let's connect and keep the momentum going. And you know what? Let's have as much fun as possible along the way. And because truly everyone can contribute to Drupal, here's my son's contribution to today's presentation. He says, thanks for listening. And now to talk more about the direction and strength of Drupal, I have the extreme pleasure of bringing to the stage my friend and partner in all things Drupal, Drupal's founder and project lead for the highly anticipated Dries Note presentation. So let's officially welcome Dries to the stage. Thank you, Heather. Um, that was very kind. And uh, by the way, I loved watching the Lasso. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah, it's probably one of the funniest shows I've watched in the past year. And and you're right. There's a lot of important lessons in that show as well. So it was, I highly recommend it. You know. Yes. So thanks thank you for, for making... in indulging me and letting me take a slightly different turn today. Um, no, so no, thanks no. everyone. And, and Dries, we're excited to hear what what you have to share with us. Yeah. Awesome. Well, let's do it. So also from me, welcome everybody to DrupalCon. Um, it's great to see so many people at DrupalCon this year. I think we have more people than last year, which is really nice to see. Um, I've got a lot to cover today, so I'm going to jump right in. Um, so what's on the agenda? Well done. There we go. Uh, what will I talk about today? Well, um, we've been very busy, as you know. We've been busy working on Drupal 9. We've been busy working on Drupal 10. We've been maintaining Drupal 7. Uh, so I definitely want to talk about those things. Um, I will also give an update on the strategic initiatives. Uh, and those are the initiatives um, that result in innovations that come to future versions of Drupal. So it's really talking about new features uh, that will come out uh, shortly. I will talk about the health of the Drupal community and specifically in terms of uh, contribution dynamics. And then last but not least, I want to talk about the magic of contribution. I know that is a little bit mysterious, but we'll get to that. Um, so let's get started. Uh, so first, let's talk about Drupal 7, 8, 9, and 10. So first of all, I wanted to remind everyone that Drupal 7 is end of life in November of 2022. So that means that if you are still on Drupal 7, you have a little bit more than a year to migrate. Um, and as a reminder, because people ask me this all the time, Drupal 7 was released 11 years ago. I mean, it's been a great release for us. In many ways, we changed the game for Drupal. Uh, we can, you know, reminisce about that later. But um, what I want to, the point that I want to make today is that because Drupal is more than Drupal 7 is more than 10 years old, it has become harder and harder to run Drupal 7 on newer versions of PHP newer versions of MySQL, et cetera, et cetera. And because of that, it's really time to move forward. And migrating from Drupal 7 to Drupal 9 will really allow you to take advantage <clears throat> of many, many great new improvements. Uh, and during the last 10 years, uh, Drupal 7 has been really well maintained thanks to the commitment of some incredible contributors. Uh, and also, many in the community have spent thousands and thousands of hours helping to build migration tools to try and automate as much as possible uh, in this migration. So I'm thankful for all of the people that have been so involved with Drupal 7 uh, the last uh, you know, 10 years or so. So if you haven't yet, it's really time to start planning your Drupal 7 migration. And if for some reason you really can migrate, uh, do know that there is commercial support available, extended commercial support for critical bug fixes. Um, Maybe a little bit more pressing is actually Drupal 8. Uh, Drupal 8 is, is end of life next month, uh, specifically on November 2nd. So after November 2nd, uh, Drupal 8 will not get security fixes. 
You know, it really means you have to upgrade your Drupal 8 sites. Now, the good news is that upgrading from Drupal 8 to Drupal 9 is relatively easy and is uh, um, a lot easier than upgrading from Drupal 7 to Drupal 9 uh, because we have a lot of tools to assist you. You know, much of that work can be uh, automated. Now, there are still quite a few Drupal 8 sites that have to migrate. And I wanted to uh, maybe ask for some help here. Um, there is about 4,000, I think, Drupal 8 modules. Um, actually, there's 10,000, I think, Drupal 8 modules. Uh, and many of those have been you know, upgraded to Drupal 9, but there are some that haven't. And there's also some that haven't that would be really easy to upgrade. And specifically, there is about 1,500 Drupal 8 modules, 1,500 Drupal 8 modules that haven't created a Drupal 9 release yet but they're actually ready, you know? All of these modules, these 1500 modules, all they need to do is a one line change to the code just to declare that they work with Drupal 9. And then obviously they have to create a release. Um, and so we actually created one line patches for all of these modules and we um, posted them to the issue queues um, of these modules. And all we need to do is the maintainers, they need to apply the patch and create a new release. So far, a lot of maintainers have, but about 1,500 modules haven't yet. And so if you're one of those maintainers, it would be great if you could check your issue queue and consider making a release. Uh, the reason I'm asking is because it really would unlock uh, thousands of sites from upgrading. Some of the people on Drupal 8, they're waiting for these modules to be ready. Uh, and so that would be my first call to action to all of the maintainers of Drupal 8 modules. Check if with a little bit of work, you can upgrade your module to Drupal 9. Now, second, we're trying to find creative ways to work around this. And we've built something that we've called the Lenient Composer Facade. It's brand new, hot of the press. You probably have not heard about it yet. Um, I won't go into the details here, but you should check out the link that I have on the screen. Uh, in essence, um, it's a new Composer endpoint that helps you upgrade. Um, all of these, you know, 1500 modules, despite not all modules having a Drupal 9 release yet. So definitely check that out. Uh, we have some great documentation about it. Now, so if you are on Drupal 7 or you are on Drupal 8, uh, time is of the essence. I highly recommend you start upgrading. And I also highly recommend that you do this uh, with the help of our top contributors. Uh, those are the organizations that know Drupal the best. And by working with them, you actually give back to Drupal as well. Uh, so I highly recommend that you use DrupalCon, this conference, uh, to talk to some of these agencies. Uh, I wouldn't wait too long because most of them are already really, really busy. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, but you don't want to, you know, be the last person <laughs> to show up uh, because um, they may be, you know, booked solid for the next few months. So talk to them if you haven't already. All right, next, let's talk about Drupal 9. Uh, on this slide, you can see some of the next milestones for Drupal 9. As you can see, there's one more release later this year, and it will come with some great new features and innovations. I'll cover those in this presentation. And then there's one or two releases next year, 9.4 and 9.5. Now, I say one or two releases because it depends on when we release Drupal 10. So first of all, yes, you heard this right. We are still on track to release Drupal 10 next year. Uh, our preferred option is to release it in June of next year, uh, in which case there wouldn't be a 9.5 release. Actually, our backup option is to release Drupal 10 at the end of the year. We haven't decided yet. Uh, it depends on how far we uh, have come along and we'll probably make that decision in the next couple of months or so. Uh, so we'll decide it soon. But just to set your expectation, Drupal 10 is coming. Uh, it's most likely or it's very likely to be next year. Uh, and uh, regardless of when we release Drupal 10, I also want you to know that the upgrade to Drupal 10 will be very easy. And I'll talk about that in a minute as well. Uh, first, I actually want to remind people why we go from Drupal 9 to Drupal 10. I do get this question a lot. People ask me, uh, why can't we stay on Drupal 9 a little bit longer? Why do you have to go to Drupal 10 already? And the reason is actually very simple. It's because of the third-party components that Drupal depends on. 
and you can see them on this slide, you see some of the components that Drupal depends on, not all of them. Um, you know, PHP, Composer, Symfony, CK Editor, uh, and actually many more. But um, the point that I wanted to make here is that each of these components have their own life cycle. Um, they release new major versions, they end of life major versions, they may or may not break backwards compatibility and so on. And something that we have to manage, right? And so when a component that we rely on goes end of life and they create a new major version, let's say that breaks backwards compatibility, we usually have to change our major version number as well, uh, because that's how semantic versioning works, the system that we use to manage versions. And so that's why, and I wanted to explain that one more time. I know it's a little bit repetitive to some people in the audience, but I do get this question a lot. And therefore I felt it was important to explain it uh, to everyone in the audience. Uh, so that's really quickly a summary on Drupal 7, 8, 9, and 10. So to repeat, Drupal 7, you've got one more year. Drupal 8, you have a little bit less than one month. Uh, Drupal 10 is doing great and is on track to be released in the next year. And so we have a lot of upgrading to do, um, upgrading of sites, upgrading of modules. Uh, if you are a module maintainer, please don't forget to check your module. With just a few minutes of work, you might be able to unblock a whole lot of Drupal 8 sites, and that would be fantastic. All right, next, I wanted to talk about the strategic initiatives for Drupal Core. Uh, these initiatives are the new features that we are working on for Drupal 9 and Drupal 10. We have not, uh, six, actually, six strategic initiatives. And in the next 30 minutes or so, I'm going to cover them all. I'm going to give you an update on each of them and actually show some of our progress. Uh, should be uh, pretty exciting, so stay tuned for that. Uh, well, so the first initiative is the Project Browser Initiative. Um, this is the newest initiative. Actually, I proposed it uh, just six months ago at the last uh, DrupalCon, and the idea is to make it really easy for site builders to find modules and to install modules and to do so right from their Drupal site. So they don't have to go to drupal.org. They can do it from their Drupal site, uh, very much like the App Store on your smartphone. That's the similar concept. And uh, proposed it six months ago, and we actually made a lot of progress. Um, since I proposed the initiative, we have identified initiative leads. You know, Chris and Leslie have stepped up um, to lead this initiative. Very grateful for that. Uh, we have been meeting weekly about the initiative, and thanks to the work of Matthew Grasmick and uh, other people, we actually have a working prototype uh, of this uh, initiative already. Um, we've got a video to show our progress, and I'm going to show it now. So let's take a look. Hi, everyone. My name is Martin Anderson Klutz, but in the Drupal community, I'm known as Matt Klutz. Happy to give you an update today on the Project Browser initiative. Now, Composer has given us an easier way to bring new modules and themes into our Drupal sites, but finding the right ones is often still a challenge, especially for people new to Drupal. While there continues to be great work done to improve the search on Drupal.org, it would be even better if site builders could find the modules they need without having to leave their own site. Project Browser Initiatives working to fill that gap by adding an interface to browse and search for projects all directly within your Drupal site. Let's take a look at how it works. Normally, you'll use the Project Browser directly in a Drupal site you manage, but since it's still in early phases of development, the Project page includes a button you can use to try out the Project Browser in a fresh install of Drupal. What we're seeing now is a new technology called DrupalPod, which creates a cloud-hosted Drupal development environment on the fly. It's an easy way to get started contributing to Drupal Core, but it's also a great way to try out one or more modules, like we're doing today with the Project Browser. With our site installed and ready to use, we can launch it full screen in a new tab by clicking on the top right. Now that we've logged in, we can go up to the Extend menu, and here we'll see a new tab where we can browse projects. We can search among all projects available on Drupal.org, but we can also look through a curated list of recommended projects meant to give site builders the confidence that they're looking through projects that have been vetted and recommended so that they're really production ready. We can also narrow them down by category, for example, by accessibility, and we can also page through different sets of results. Let's go ahead and install this accessibility checker. 
We could click on the name to see the project page under Guador. And in a future phase, we'll be able to click here to automatically download and install the project into our site code. But for today, because it's still an early phase of development, it's gonna give us the instructions on how to install it ourselves. So let's copy those and switch back to our IDE, which will start the process of using Composer to download the module to our site. We can install the module through Drush, but let's go ahead and enable it through the site UI the same way a site builder might. With our module installed, we can go to the home page and we can see that our accessibility checker is already working. No accessibility errors detected. Thanks, Drupal. And that's a first look at the project browser. We hope you'll try it out yourself and share your feedback, either in issues on the project in Drupal.org or in the project browser channel on Drupal Slack. Awesome. Well, it was very exciting uh, to see how fast we went from just a proposal to a working module that can already provide real value uh, to people. Now, there are a number of next steps. Uh, first thing we want to do is improve the user experience. It's not perfect yet. Uh, we also want to improve how you can find and filter modules. And to do so, we need to work with the Drupal Association to enrich the data feed that Drupal.org provides to uh, this module or to the Drupal sites that use this module. And then obviously, um, we want to get rid of the copy paste uh, of the composer command, or maybe we'll keep that, but we also wanted that you can automatically install modules without having to use a uh, composer because that's a big part of why we are doing this uh, initiative to make it easier for people to find and install uh, modules. Now, the good news here is that um, all of these next steps are in progress. We already have much, much better designs done. You can look at these in the issue queue. Um, we have been building uh, better filters already. We've been working with the Drupal Association on enriching the data feed. Um, the Drupal Association actually funded that work that is being worked on, so that's coming. And to get rid of the composer uh, copy-paste, if you will, uh, we'll have to work with the automated updates initiative. Uh, as you can probably imagine, there's a lot of sort of shared plumbing between this initiative and the automated updates initiative. And also you'll hear about, you'll hear about this in a few minutes, but the automated updates initiative is doing really, really well. Uh, so I feel pretty good about uh, that being in progress uh, too. And so to be very clear today, we implemented uh, the project browser as a contributed module. Once we've done these next steps, our goal is to start moving uh, that contributed module into core, which will also take some time and effort, um, but then it's available to everybody uh, out of the box. Now, fortunately, you don't have to wait for that. You can already install this contributed module as well uh, and give it a try and, cons and consider becoming a contributor to the Project Browser initiative. We would love your help. All right, the second initiative that I want to talk about is the Decoupled Menus initiative. This initiative we launched about a year ago, so not that long ago. Uh, I think it was September of 2020. And as a reminder, this initiative had two goals. The first goal is actually to create a small component, a small JavaScript component. And we wanted the component to be small so that we could actually ship it and ship it quickly. Uh, but we also wanted this one component to be useful, something that people would adopt uh, and actually use. And with those requirements in mind, we picked a menu component because, well, it's small-ish and all sites or all applications or almost all sites and almost all applications they actually use a menu. <laughs> and also because um, most of the time, uh, JavaScript frontends actually hard code these menus. They don't wire it up with the content management system uh, on the backend. And so we felt this was useful. Um, we actually made a ton of progress on this as well. And I have a video for it. So let's take a look at where we're at with this initiative. I'm Brian Perry, one of the coordinators for the Decoupled Menus Initiative. And I'm here to provide a quick update on our recent efforts. We'll take a look at the API endpoint provided by the decoupled menus module, community built components that can consume that data, and how content updates in Drupal are reflected in your front end application. In this example, we'll be using Drupal to provide content for Umami, everyone's favorite culinary magazine website. We currently have a simple main navigation with just a few menu links enabled. To provide menu data to our decoupled application, we're going to enable the decoupled menus module. 
which provides additional HTTP endpoints for easily consuming Drupal managed menus. This is currently a contributed module, but there is an open issue to include the module in Drupal core. The endpoint provided by this module uses the structure system slash menu slash menu ID slash link set. So we can take a look at the response for the main menu and see our menu links. The endpoint also respects authorization and permissions. So if I make a request for the account menu as an unauthenticated user, I will only get back the login link. To render this data on our front end, we're going to use a menu component provided by the generic Drupal Web Components project. This is a new general project on Drupal.org, which also publishes to NPM, so that the component can be bundled with your JavaScript project or even loaded via CDM. The components provided by this project are intentionally stripped down so that they can be overridden and restyled by the consuming application. Since they are web components, they can be used with any JavaScript framework, even Twig. Here's our menu component rendered in a Next.js site. The component is restyled and displays the menu links provided by the decoupled menus endpoint. Let's take a look at what the experience would be like for a content editor who wants to make menu updates for our decoupled site. We'll add a new about link under the top level of the main menu. And then additionally, we'll reorder a few things. We'll move the about link up higher in the menu and also enable some submenu items under articles. So now when I go back to my server side rendered Next.js application and reload the page, my menu edits are reflected automatically. Marketers and content creators can continue to use Drupal's UI to make edits without requiring developer intervention and developers can use their JavaScript framework of choice. A number of contributors have also created other variations on menu components in order to validate this new menu endpoint. Here's a interactive example using Svelte that shows code side by side with menu output. There's an alternative presentation uh, built with React and Next.js that we see here. Another menu component using React Bootstrap, which we see here in the mobile presentation, and even a alternative web component example that uses a separate web component library. A huge thanks to all of our contributors thus far. We still have work to do to get this menu endpoint into core, are looking for some help improving the documentation, and we'd like to move on to building Drupal-friendly components beyond menus. Join us in the Decoupled Menus Initiative channel on Drupal Slack. We'd love to have your help. All right, very, very exciting, I think. And as you saw, we, not, we don't only have one component, we actually have multiple uh, menu components right now, which is uh, really cool. Um, and best of all, they've already shipped, they're available um, already. Um, as a next step, uh, we still have to move the contributed module, as you saw, uh, to uh, Drupal Core. And so that's basically what's left to do here. You can see the issue on the slide and we would love your help. Now, as I mentioned, there's two goals, right? And the second goal is to take all the learnings from building this first component and uh, to turn these learnings into something that we can repeat. And the goal here is to create many components, you know, not just one, but many. Uh, and to make creating components repeatable, we had to figure out a lot of things. We had to figure out how to collaborate on building them. Uh, where would we you know, write all of this JavaScript code, for example? How do we test them? How do we release components to NPM? How do we manage security issues if they were to come up? And you know, maybe most of all, how do we teach people in the community on how to contribute more components uh, to Drupal? And so we've made a lot of progress on that as well. Uh, we still have to do some work on the documentation. Uh, to do so, we're going to use GitLab pages that's just been enabled in beta and should be uh, generally available GA uh, for everyone to use uh, in the next uh, few weeks. So really exciting. We figured a lot of these things out. And so overall, I feel like this initiative is almost done. Um, and I think that's a big deal. I think that's a big deal because it truly opens the door um, for JavaScript developers, web component developers to join the Drupal community. And that would allow Drupal to go to new places, if you will, 
And so let's make sure that we welcome all of these JavaScript developers, that we continue to invest in making the documentation and the tools better so that we can have uh, you know, many of these uh, components. Um, I think that's important because uh, Drupal needs to be a really, really great headless uh, content management system. And it is already a great headless content manage management system today um, with things like REST API, and JSON API and GraphQL, and now with the menu component, which by the way is very unique. Most headless CMSs, actually none that I know of, uh, manages menus really well. So this is a, a real advantage compared to other headless CMSs. But now um, the next step is to create more components. And I actually would love to set a goal of creating 10 more components. And I'd love to come back to this at a future DrupalCon and say, hey, we went from one component to 10 components. And what's really great is that there is a way to do it now. You know, you, you in the audience, the viewer, you can step in right here and help us create uh, more components. Uh, and that's important because headless momentum is growing fast. Uh, it's probably the number one question that I get when I speak at uh, events, uh, Drupal events, other events um, around the world or, or virtually now. People ask me about headless all the time. And the growth in Headless is uh, partially driven by the growth in JavaScript frameworks and the desire for front-end developers to use uh, JavaScript to build uh, front-ends. But there's also an important shift happening in how organizations are building their technology stack. Uh, and it's one of the hottest topics in our industry. And it's the concept of the composable enterprise. Uh, I'm sure many of you have heard about this. I'm also sure for a lot of you, this is maybe a new concept, but what does this mean? Well, it means that organizations are rebuilding their stack based on headless or API first microservices. Now, personally, I don't love the term composable enterprise in the context of Drupal because it sounds, you know, well, enterprisey. <laughs> and I believe that there is an opportunity to democratize this idea of you know, microservices-based architecture and to make it more inclusive of smaller organizations. And so for me, the term um, composable organization would be uh, preferred, uh, but uh, you know, I digress to be honest because it's not really about what we call it. Uh, the point here is that composability is a growing trend and we should expect it to grow quite a bit in the next five years. Um, and composability, if you're not familiar, composability is a lot like modularity, you know, a concept that we know super well in Drupal. We've been doing modularity for 20 years in Drupal. Uh, the main difference is that when you talk about composability, you're talking about these independent microservices. And independent microservices can have some advantages. They also have disadvantages, by the way. But the advantages are that you can scale them independently, that you can release them independently, and that you can have you know, independent teams uh, working on them. I may talk about this more in the future if it's of interest, but for now, I wanted to say that headless is really important for Drupal. It's where we need to continue to invest and composability is a part of that alongside with um, JavaScript frontends. And that's driven because Websites are now very much integrated with a lot of different technologies. And that's where these um, web service endpoints and composability are so important. Now, thanks to JSON API, thanks to GraphQL, um, we already have a lot of these web service endpoints and we have them in a way that's better compared to many, many other um, content management systems uh, in the world. So we should be really proud of what we have. We really should be. Um, and then if we start building more JavaScript components, as we talked about uh, just a few minutes ago, uh, that would be a really incredible next step in pushing Drupal forward uh, to the future. So that's why this um, decoupled menu component initiative was so important because it puts us on a path that will bring a lot of great things uh, to the Drupal project. All right, next I wanted to talk about the easy out of the box initiative. Let's see, so the goal of this initiative uh, is to have Layout Builder, uh, the media library, and Claro added to the standard profile. Um, that may not mean much to some of you, 
But what that actually means is that we want these features to be enabled by default for every new Drupal installation, for every new Drupal user. And these three features are very, very important capabilities. Uh, we know this because uh, we did many, many surveys. Um, and based on these surveys, we decided uh, to build them. And in these surveys, people literally begged us for better layout building. They begged us for better media management. And they begged us for a more modern backend UI, which Claro provides. And we've built this, you know, and it's working. And actually, people love it. <laughs> However, we haven't enabled it yet by default. And that's a bit of a shame because to get the maximum impact of these features that we spent uh, so long building, a couple of years of building, uh, we really want to enable them by default uh, so that everybody gets to use them. Now, the challenge here is that we've made limited progress. I would say Claro has made some progress, but Media and Layout Builder have made almost no progress, frankly. Uh, and at the current pace, I'm not sure when we would get this initiative done. And so we need to think about what's the future of this initiative. Do you want to keep um, at it? Do you want to keep reporting on it? Uh, and personally, I'd like to find a way to get it done and ideally get it done by Drupal 10. I think that would be a major milestone for us to achieve. And so my recommendation actually is that we consider reducing the scope of the work. Um, and I actually discussed this with some of the maintainers of some of these uh, three components. And there is a belief that reducing the scope uh, might be possible. Now, I haven't spoken to everyone yet, uh, so I may not have all of the details. It might not be possible. It might not be a good idea, uh, which is why I put a question mark next to this uh, finish line. But uh, what I would like us to do, and hopefully we can do some of this at uh, DrupalCon, is discuss and evaluate this concept of reducing the scope, moving um, you know, the finish line, if you will. And the reason I think it's important is because I believe end users have so much to gain from these new features. Um, and so I love, would love to find a way. Um, if you're looking to contribute, this might be a great area to contribute. Some of the changes aren't very hard. I think there's maybe two or three issues with Layout Builder, a few issues with Media uh, Library. So we're not talking about a lot of work. As you can see, um, these initiatives are actually pretty far along. We just need to kind of push them over that finish line or reduce the finish, move the finish line a little bit. All right. Next, automated updates. Um, the automated updates initiative is all about making it easier to update Drupal site, to make it easier to maintain them. Uh, one of the reasons we are building this um, is to make sure that everybody's on the latest um, security release of Drupal. So what that means is if uh, in the future, a security release would come out, uh, Drupal itself would be able to to update itself uh, to this um, you know, latest version. And that's obviously great <laughs> because it will help uh, with security of Drupal, but uh, it's also something that's really hard, right? Um, when you have hundreds of thousands of sites that will start updating themselves, there's a lot of things to deal with. That's pretty complex and we really don't wanna get that wrong. Um, and so that's why it's actually been taking some time uh, to work on this initiative. There's been a lot of great effort on this initiative, but it's been taking some time. Now, uh, what's exciting is that today for the first time, the first time we can actually show it to you. You know, all the pieces have come together and we can put them all together in a working uh, demo. So I have a video of that as well. So let's take a look. To demonstrate the progress of the automatic updates initiative, I'm going to show an example of updating a local copy of my personal site, which is built on Drupal 9. My site is pretty simple. I post pictures of my travels and of course my dog, Gracie. I also have a page for my SoundCloud. I promise I didn't talk to Reese into letting me make this video just to promote my SoundCloud. Now let's take a look at the updates I need to make on my site. You can see here that I have a few contrib modules on my site and they're all currently up to date, but I do need to make an update to Drupal Core. This is a security update that was recently released, so it is very important that I update as soon as possible. My site currently doesn't have the automatic updates module that is under development installed. So if we look at the updates tab, we can see that it shows the core update, but tells us we have to apply this update manually. 
Now let's install the new version of the Automatic Updates module being developed for Drupal Core. There is an existing version of this module that can be used for non-composer-based sites, but the 2.x version that is being developed for Drupal Core is fully composer-aware. After the Automatic Updates module is enabled, if we go back to the Updates tab, we now see the Update tab will allow us to update Drupal Core to the new security release. I simply click Update to start off the process. Behind the scenes, the module is creating a copy of my site excluding the files upload directories and other parts of the site that are not controlled by Composer. Once the site is copied, the module will run a Composer command to update to Drupal 9.2.6 and the copy of my site. After the Composer command completes successfully, the module will do a few checks to make sure the command ran successfully. Now we are ready to apply the update to our site. I will use the default option to put the site into maintenance mode as we apply the update. This makes sure we don't have any site visitors as the update is being applied. Because we already ran the composer command and because the module is able to ignore files that have not changed since the last version of Drupal, the site is in maintenance mode for a minimal time. Now our update is complete. Our site is now running on the latest security release of Drupal Core. Behind the scenes, our Composer JSON and Composer Lock files have been updated, just like any standard Composer update. Now I want to make sure that my site remains up to date. Although this process of updating core is pretty easy, I want to make sure that if there is a security release and I'm too busy or I'm on vacation, my site still remains up to date and secure. If we look at the Update Settings tab, there is a new option to automatically update core. These updates will happen in the background during cron runs. I can either choose all supported updates or only security updates. Since the first version of the automatic updates module in Drupal Core will only support patch level updates, this means that my site will automatically be updated for all releases and the 9.2 minor release. Since each minor version of Drupal Core is supported for security fixes for about a year, this means I will only need to update my version of Drupal Core manually once a year. All right, this is very exciting. Uh, we worked so hard on this and uh, an impressive amount of work went into this. I know it may not look like a lot because it's doing a lot of things behind the scenes, uh, but trust me, that was an impressive amount of work to get to this point. Now, we still have quite a bit of work left ahead of us as well. Um, we're actually adding additional security on top of Composer, something that we're calling package signing. Uh, and that needs to be enabled on Drupal.org. Uh, the Drupal Association is actively working on this and they believe they can complete this work in time for the next core inclusion window. So in other words, I think it will take a couple of months or so, not too long. Uh, we're also still collecting feedback on the user experience. Uh, we wanna make it as easy and as intuitive of, as possible. And then last but not least, we actually want more people to help test this. Uh, it's important because there is many different hosting environments and we want to make sure it works in all of them. Um, and the good news is you can help test this today because there is a uh, module available. It's in development. It's not in beta or it's not GA. So try it at your own risk, but we, we have something that people can help with uh, and we would love um, your help testing that module. So, and then when all of that is done, um, we will start merging this contributed module into Drupal core. And the end result will be a secure uh, and modern uh, automated update system, secure because of the additional package signing, modern because it's actually using Composer under the hook, which is really nice and clever, and really will be something to be very proud of uh, to have as part of Drupal. So pretty exciting. Um, so next, let's talk about the Drupal 10 Readiness Initiative. This initiative is all about upgrading those third-party components uh, that Drupal depends on. And this is the same slide or a very similar slide to the one that I've shown you earlier in the presentation. And it shows these uh, or some of the third-party components that uh, Drupal relies on. Um, now, in general, we're making really, really great progress on upgrading all of these components. Uh, this is well-managed and I would say we are on track. And the result is obviously that Drupal uh, 10 will be very secure because we don't use end of life components, but it uh, also means that we'll be running on the latest and the greatest versions of these components, right? When we upgrade these components, we get all of the innovations, all of the improvements that these projects make. Uh, and that's uh, very exciting. So it's not just about security. Uh, you know, 
that's very important, obviously, but it's also about getting all of these, um, you know, additional capabilities. And so in many ways, you know, we, um, you know, the core team, we're doing all of the hard work, you know, the hard work of upgrading these components so that you uh, can just upgrade Drupal, you know, to Drupal 10 in just a few clicks. Uh, and all of these things will uh, become available to you. It's also worthwhile to take a step back and look at the components that we picked. And from where I'm sitting, uh, we absolutely sort of picked the right horses, if you will. For example, we adopted Symphony, uh, I think, in 2013, so about eight years ago. And we were one of the first large projects to do so. Um, and looking back, you know, I think that was a fantastic choice. If you look at you know, current data, uh, you can see that Symphony continues to grow really fast. And in fact, it's the largest PHP framework right now. Uh, the same is true with other components. CK Editor, for example, came out with a new major version that comes with its own uh, improvements and you know, modernized architecture and better data models and all of these things. So each of the components that we rely on are doing really well, which I think is something uh, you know just to keep in the back of our minds. We got some more great news as well, and that news is that upgrades actually keep getting easier. We keep getting better at managing major versions. We keep making automa automation tools uh, better and better. And when you think about an upgrade from say eight to nine, or from Drupal nine to ten, uh, most of the work of that upgrade uh, is managing deprecated code. It means changing your code and your modules to remove uh, deprecated code. Now, the good news is that with Drupal 10, we can actually automate 96% of that work. That's a big improvement because in Drupal 9, we could only automate 30%, which means that the upgrade from 9 to 10 will be three times more automated than the upgrade from Drupal 8 to Drupal 9. Uh, and that's pretty exciting, I think. Uh, and it shows that we're getting better and better at managing these uh, upgrades. If you want to learn more about how these automations work, I really recommend you check out Rector. Uh, it's a fantastic tool. Everybody can help contribute little automations to it. I want to thank Palantir for funding so much of the work on Rector. It has really changed the game for Drupal because it has allowed us to work uh, smarter, not harder. Um, and so the big news here is that the upgrade to Drupal 9 was already easy, but that the upgrade to Drupal 10 will be even easier. And I also want to do a special shout out, a special thank you to the core committer team for managing this so carefully and so expertly. A lot of the reason for why this is working so well is because of the attention to detail and the care that goes into reviewing and committing every patch and assessing whether it would or would not break uh, backwards compatibility. All right, something else that I want you to be aware of. There are some modules that ship with Drupal 9 that won't come along for Drupal 10. I'm removing them out of core. Um, why? Because we don't think they're super relevant um, sort of in 2022 when Drupal 10 uh, gets released, uh, but also because we think these modules could move faster when they're not in core. As contributed modules, they might be able to move faster. And secondly, because without them, core itself can also move faster, which is also something uh, really important and something that we want to consider. So uh, we love to find people to adopt these modules instead of just throwing them over the wall. So please, you know, raise your hand, if you will, if you want to become a maintainer of one of these modules. There is a link on the slide where you can, you know, raise your hand, so to speak, and it would really help, you know, it would help us move faster with core. All right, last but not least, I think, there is Olivero. Olivero is the name of our new front-end theme, and the goal is for Olivero to replace Bartik as the new default team, right? And so Olivero is actually doing great, uh, really great. Uh, at this point, I believe there's only two more issues to fix that could have changed in the last 24 hours or so. Uh, one of these issues is a bug, uh, and the other issue is actually a request uh, to test Olivero on all major browsers. Uh, so if you look at the issue on the screen, 
Uh, and then you look on the right, you see a lot of child issues um, for each major browser. We want somebody to test uh, them. Now, if you're new to Drupal, um, you're looking for a way to contribute. Uh, testing Olivera on major browsers might be a great way to start. Um, I don't know if you know this, but Olivero actually ships with Drupal 9 today. Uh, it's an experimental module, uh, but all you need to do is install Drupal 9, which you may have already installed. You can enable Olivero and you can help us test um, you know, whether it works. Now, um, would be great to get this one over the finish line um, because again, it would be a major improvement uh, for so many people. Uh, and one thing I think we should all be very proud of is how much effort has gone into Olivero's accessibility. You know, the team has put so much effort into this. They did accessibility testing, and they actually did some accessibility testing with the National Federation of the Blind. And here's what they had to say about Olivero. You know, Olivero is very well done and low vision accessible. We are not finding any issues with contrast, focus, or scaling. The forms are really well, well done, and the content is easy to find and navigate. What a fantastic quote. And ever since we did that, we've actually made more improvements. Uh, special shout out to Lullabot and the initiative lead, Michael Herschel, for putting so much time and effort into this. I feel like we're really, really close with this initiative. So. To summarize the initiative update, um, all in all, I believe we are making fantastic progress. Uh, we're hitting quite a few milestones. I hope you feel the same way. And based on my own assessment, uh, not everybody may fully agree, but based on my own assessment, uh, three of the six initiatives, half of the initiatives are almost complete, or at least over the 80% uh, completion line. Uh, and the others are making rapid progress, as you can see. And so that's very exciting. Uh, it's exciting because once these are done, 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 uh, we can start talking about new initiatives. Uh, and hopefully that will be just in time for Drupal 10. So more to come on that in future Dries notes. All right, for the third section, we have four section. This is section three. I wanted to talk about um, contribution dynamics or contribution trends. And some of you may know, but every year, I uh, spent a few weeks working on a blog post, which is called Who Sponsors Drupal Development? Uh, and it an, provides an insight in how the community is doing from a contribution point of view and um, how things are evolving. Now, I haven't posted this year's report yet. I usually do around this time. Uh, I'm kind of finishing it up and hope to post it, you know, maybe next week or shortly after DrupalCon. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. But this year, for the first time, I actually noticed that a lot of the contribution metrics are down. And sometimes they're down uh, quite a bit. And you can see some of the key metrics here on the screen. And at first, I panicked. You know, just like you might be panicking uh, right now. Uh, but as I did more research, I realized that while these metrics are down, there's actually a a lot of great explanations for it. And there's also some really, really positive data points uh, underneath these trends as well. Uh, and that data suggests that we are actually a very strong and a very resilient community, and that this slowdown in contribution could be of temporary nature. So I want to talk about that next. Um, so let's get into that, all right? So to understand what was really going on, I wanted to look at um, you know, attrition information. Um, did people leave Drupal? Did contributors leave Drupal? Or did they just become less active, for example? Um, and that's what, what we call the attrition rate. Some of you may not be familiar with it, but it's attrition rate is basically the percentage of individuals or the percentage of organizations that stopped contributing in the past year compared to the previous year, right? So the first thing I did, I actually looked at the top 50 individual contributors and the top 50 organizational contributors. And top 50 individual contributors are people like Alex Pot or Catch or Volkswagen Chick or XJM, uh, many of the people you probably know. Top 50 organizational contributors are organizations like Acquia or Third and Grove, CINT, Previous Next, Canopy, Lullabot, 
uh, et cetera, et cetera. Lots of great organizations. Now, the first thing that I noticed when I looked at these top 50s is that no one in the top 50 individual contributors stopped contributing. And that no one in the top 50 organizational contributors stopped contribute, no one, which in many ways is fantastic, right? Um, however, what I did see is that roughly 80% of the people and organizations in the top 50 contributed less. So they didn't stop, but they contributed less. And that appeared to be a trend. And I decided to investigate that trend a little bit more. And so I expanded from the top 50 to the top 1,000 individual contributors and to the top 250 organizational contributors. You know, why these numbers, you may ask? Well, I picked these numbers because they represent 80% of all of the contributions to Drupal. And that includes both Drupal Core and Contrib. Because Drupal follows a long tail, um, I felt like that was the right approach to look at 80% of all of the contributions. So these are our best, or I should say our most active contributors and our most active organizational contributors as well. Now, I also wanted to try and put some of that data into perspective. And so I decided to add a benchmark or a comparison point. And for the benchmark, I wanted to look at soft, I, I picked software and services companies. Now, uh, a software and services company could be like a Drupal agency, right? Many of you work for a Drupal agency. It could be sort of like the company that you work at if you work for one. Now, this comparison isn't perfect, right? And I'm the first to admit it because we'll be comparing a for-profit organization with Drupal, which is an open source project, which is kind of its own animal, if you will. And so while this comparison isn't perfect, I still believe it's very useful. I think it's very useful because many of you may not be familiar with attrition rates, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it provides a useful perspective. I'm not suggesting we, you know, say this is the benchmark, but I think it will provide a useful perspective in the explanation of the data. So let's get into it. Um, so most software and services companies have an attrition rate of 15% or more. And 15% is actually really good. Right now, because of sort of being post-COVID, a lot of companies are actually between 20 and even 30%. Attrition is running high right now. Now, what does 15% mean? Well, it means that if a company has 100 employees, 15 of them leave the company in a given year. Now, why are companies happy with 15%? Uh, well, because mathematically, it actually means that on average, an employee stays with that company for, amount, for almost six and a half years, right? And so if you put it that way, um, you can see that six and a half years is pretty good. And why? That is a goal that a lot of organizations have. Because nowadays, a lot of people don't stay with their employer for six and a half years, right? So now I looked at the top thousand contributors in Drupal, and it turns out that in our top thousand individual contributors, only 77 people stopped contributing in the last year. So a 7.7% attrition rate. So now that's twice as good as the for-profit software or services company, uh, which to me suggests that, that the um, you know individual contributors are actually pretty loyal. Because if you think about it, if you do that math, it shows that on average, somebody that is in the top thousand individual contributors contributes to Drupal uh, on average for 13 years. They remain active on average for 13 years, which I think is amazing and world-class. Now, if I extend that to the top 250 organizational contributors, who again are responsible for 80% of all the contribution in Drupal, I only counted eight organizations in the top 250 that stopped contributing in the last year. And eight out of 250 is 3%. Now, when I dug into that a little bit more, five of the eight organizations are actually end users. Uh, what, I, what do I mean by end users? Um, this would be um, organizations like Pfizer, and Pfizer didn't uh, stop contributing. Um, you know, five out of the eight organizations stopped contributing 
most likely they switched away from Drupal to another content management system, or maybe their Drupal project just went away, uh, the site went away. Uh, I think that's not an unhealthy number for, you know, five out of 250 to stop contributing. But maybe more importantly, in the top 250, there was only three Drupal agencies that stopped contributing. So the attrition rate of the Drupal agencies in a top 250 is 1.2%. What that means is that it's very, very, very rare that a top Drupal agency stops contributing to Drupal. So what all of this data told me is that there isn't anything like an exodus. People aren't really leaving Drupal at a massive scale or anything. In fact, it told me the opposite. People are extremely loyal. Organizations are extremely loyal to Drupal, but everybody is sort of consistently contributing less. They haven't contributed as much in the last year as they have in previous years. And I even validated that in a couple of different ways. I looked at different contribution types. And you can see here that all the different contribution types, building themes, distributions, um, events, you know, helping with events, all of these things went backwards uh, consistently, except actually contribution to Drupal core. And Drupal core mo moving forward, I think, is obviously a huge uh, I mean, it's, it's great. It's it's really great to see uh, that. I think it's a very healthy, um, you know, sort of tidbit in the bigger scheme. Um, so everything went backwards. If you look at the data by country, and on this slide, you see the top 20 countries that contribute to Drupal. You can see that the green bar is, I think, shorter everywhere, you know? So um, every country has contributed less. Again, it's not... Um, you know, anything else really. Um, and the same trend is true if you look beyond the top 20, by the way, there's just like a global reduction <laughs> in contribution. And I think there's a few reasons uh, for this. And I think one of the reasons is COVID, you know, uh, COVID has added uh, stress and extra work to people's lives. Uh, some people may have lost income, um, you know, parents, uh, had to homeschool or are still busy homeschooling their children. Uh, people may have Zoom fatigue. Um, and, you know, in general, times are stressful and COVID made contribution more difficult or even less desirable. And we've also lost in-person events and code sprints. Uh, and those actually spurred a lot of contribution. On this chart, you see um, the amount of contribution in each month. Uh, and you can clearly see that the months with a DrupalCon where we had an in-person code sprint, and usually I think five to 800 people or so contribute at these code sprints. You can see that these are very um, sort of productive months in terms of total uh, contribution, right? And if you compare that to sort of post-COVID, you can see that we had a productive first code sprint and, and probably COVID hadn't fully set in yet, if you will. Uh, but definitely more recent code sprints, we, we haven't had the same kind of uh, contribution levels. And I think it's because we don't have these events in person. Uh, now, a second reason for the slowdown is a concept that I'm calling the Drupal super cycle. Uh, it's a new concept. I have not talked about this before. And in fact, it's more of a theory, to be quite honest. And, and only time will tell if this is a valid theory. So let me explain what it is and how it can help uh, explain the slowdown. So here's that chart again, right? The chart that shows the amount of contribution each month. And by the way, it shows this across core and contrib. It's all contribution, not just code contributions. Uh, also, you know, events, you know, everything that goes into Drupal's credit system. And you may have noticed that peak there, you know, the peak at the beginning of 2020. Now, that is actually the release of Drupal 9. Uh, and the release of Drupal 9 was the peak contribution. And what you see is that there tends to be a flurry of activity before a major release. And it's driven by the fact that module maintainers and contributors, they're working on their projects or contributed modules to make it compatible and get ready for that major release. And as a result, total contribution goes up. And then after the major release, there is a slowdown. There's a slower period. And that's because a lot of that work, that upgrade work was done. And now we shift from more active development to let's say maintenance work, just bug fixes. Uh, things like that. And 
you know, major releases only happen two, every two or three years. Um, and so right now we're in a slower period. In the last year, there wasn't a major release. Uh, and so we have been in a slower period for a full year, right? When I do my analysis, right? And um, so it will be interesting to see if this Drupal cycle concept is valid because uh, you know we're planning to release Drupal 10 next year. And, the, and hopefully, I, I think we'll see increased activity uh, in the next year leading up to the Drupal 10 release. Uh, time will tell. Now, another factor in this slowdown, I think, is, is Rector and all of the automations that we have. Now, as I showed you earlier, uh, with Drupal 10, actually 95% of the upgrade work can be automated and maybe it will be even higher by the time we release Drupal 10. And when we automate things, obviously that results in less contribution, um, but in a good way, this is a good reduction of contribution because we're working smarter, not harder. So it's something to keep in mind. But then last but not least, as part of my research, I also reached out to different agencies, Drupal agencies, and just asked them like, what's going on in your business? Uh, any reason why um, you're contributing less, you know? And I reached out to like, you know, 10 or so, and I got back some some great responses. And um, what was amazing is that all of these organizations are growing very, very fast right now. And all of them are trying to keep up with their business growth. Um, and they told me things like client work uh, has taken a lot more time. Um, and that has taken away time for contribution because they feel time pressure. Um, some told me that Drupal actually has all the features they need <laughs> to build um, successful digital experiences for their customers. Uh, they told me Drupal is super stable and robust now, and they feel like maybe there is just less need to contribute. Um, people said there is a shortage of Drupal talents that have to hire new people, train new people. Um, that's taken time and it's hard to train new people on how to contribute to Drupal, especially when there is no physical events. You know, it's, it's hard to get passionate virtually. It's much easier to get passionate when we all get together uh, in person. Um, and so I got all sorts of reasons. Uh, it all made sense to me, uh, but I think the good news is, you know, look at all these businesses in Europe doing well. I think growing 30, 40, you know, lots of growth in Europe. And so I understand that uh, contribution may have slowed down. So to wrap up this section, contribution has slowed, but contributors aren't leaving. And I think that's really important. Uh, there's many factors that contribute to this slowdown from COVID to this Drupal super cycle concept or theory to more automation to, you know, businesses being busy growing, which uh, is all good. So hopefully that provide you some additional perspective. Um, and, you know, as I said, I panicked at first, but having gone through this analysis, I do feel uh, better and I'm uh, optimistic that the growth will, you know, come back and that we'll see uh, more contribution. Hopefully all of these you know, Drupal agencies that are growing as they're hiring new people, my hope is that they will, uh, you know, train people on how to become contributors uh, to the Drupal project. So um, before I wrap up this section and go to the next section, I do want to, you know, say thank you. You know, I'm, I'm very grateful um, for the many uh, contributors that we have, both individual contributors as well as organizational contributors. I'm, I'm very grateful for your continued involvement, for your loyalty, for your resiliency, uh, especially during COVID times. It's amazing to see that we have thousands of people contributing and, uh, you know, over a thousand organizations contributing as well. Um, really nice. And, you know, we keep making great progress, as I told you about uh, in the initiative updates. Now, last but not least, in the last section of this Dries note, I want to talk a little bit about the magic of contribution, right? Because that was a lot of data that I just showed. And um, it was, you know, a decent summary, I guess, of the status of the uh, contributor dynamics. And, and while that data is useful, um, and while we can explain some of the slowdowns, I still think it's really, really, really important that we are focused on, on attracting more people to Drupal and turning these people into contributors, right? There is always, we need more uh, talent uh, in the project. 
So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, now, no, you know, a couple of quick stories. Um, and I believe in community. I mean, obviously, I believe in community, but I also believe in the power of the individual. I think both are really important. And history clearly shows that one person can make a huge different difference in the world. And there's so many great stories. There's hundreds of great stories. And there's a few uh, names here on the screen. And I don't have time to highlight them all, but I would like to highlight one story. And that's the story of uh, Marta Gellhorn. And she was an author and a journalist, and she's considered one of the greatest war uh, correspondents of all time and completely changed how uh, war reporting was done. And one of her first breakthroughs actually came when she reported on the Spanish Civil War. And without a formal assignment from a newspaper, she just decided to jump in. She actually forged documents to get into the war zone. So nobody told her to do this. She just did it. And her attention to the human cost of war, to the human suffering in war, was a radical departure from the usual reporting that people did at the time. You know, the usual reporting was to focus on battlefield strategies, sort of um, executive assessments of generals in the field, but it wasn't really about the human suffering. And Marta changed that. And because of that, war reporting was never the same. And that was really important because it literally changed how nations think about war. It made all the nations in the world more reluctant to go to war. So it's an incredible story of how one woman decided to jump in, changed reporting, and had a tremendous impact um, in, in, the, in the world, right? It's a power of the individual. Um, and there's, again, many great stories. Now, history also shows that there's a lot of power in not telling someone that something is hard or that something can be done. Um, there's a lot of amazing stories here as well, and I wish I could tell you more of them. But uh, one great story uh, is sort of the unsolvable math problem story. And this is a story about George Danzig. And he was a student at the University of California in Berkeley. And one day he arrived late to class and he found that there was two math problems written on the blackboard. And because he was late, uh, he didn't know that these were examples of unsolved math problems. And so he, he jotted them down and he mistook them for a part of a homework assignment. Uh, so he went home and, if, and he solved them. And a few days later, he actually went back to his professor and he apologized. He said, I'm, I'm sorry it took me so long. It took me a couple extra days to solve uh, my homework because the problem seemed a little bit harder than usual. And... It turns out that Danzig solved a math problem that no mathematician has been able to solve since Einstein. And it just shows like sometimes if you don't tell people that something is impossible or hard, um, it brings that creativity, um, a unique perspective to the problem and they can actually solve it. Now, I tell these stories because I believe um, in the power of community, but I also believe in these two other powers that I just highlighted. You know, they're true for Drupal, they're true for open source. You know, individuals can single handedly make a big impact. And there's so much power in just jumping in and starting, you know, maybe not knowing what you're about to get into. Um, and you know, they apply to me for sure. They apply to the people that you see on the screen. Um, this is a photo of the first DrupalCon group photo. We were you know, 30 or so people. And like, you know, talking about myself, like I started Drupal not knowing anything about content management. I was very naive in, in many ways. And, you know, it was no one that told me. There was no one that told us, you know, the people in the photo that content management systems are really, really, really hard and complex. No one told us we would be spending 20 years of our life working on this. Nobody told us we would end up competing to some of the largest technology companies in the world. And the fact that we didn't know was a good thing. You know, we all just jumped in and amazing things happened, right? And, and continue to happen. I think about things like CCK 
or views or the taxonomy system. All of these things were started by one person, you know, scratching an, an itch, you know, not knowing that these systems would live on for many, many years. Um, and you know, anyway, the recurring theme here is that one person can have a massive impact. Uh, one individual can change the course of Drupal's history. And, you know, that new contributors, they bring a new and clever perspective. They bring new approaches, you know, diverse ideas are really important. And with that in mind, I think there's two things we need to focus on. One is to make it easy for new people to join and then make it easy for uh, these people to contribute because it optimizes our chances of someone doing something amazing and changing the course of Drupal. So let's talk about making it easy to join. You know, first of all, there's a lot of things that we do really, really, really well. And there's, I can tell you, there's so many open source projects jealous of how we do things. You know, we actually have a very welcoming community and people will often state that. Uh, but we have, you know, code of conduct. We have values and principles. We're very accessible. We have great events like this one. There's a lot of things that we do to make it easy to join. Uh, but there's always more we can do. And today I want to highlight one thing. Um, and that's that the way that people want to get started with software is not the same as 10 years ago. And developers want something different today. They expect something different. And Homebrew is a great example of that. You go to the main page of the Homebrew website, and the first thing you see above default is a one-line command to install Homebrew. That's it. You know, It's how people want to get started. Symphony, very similar. You go to the installation instruction. What they lead with is a one-line command to install Symphony. It's the new normal. Simplicity, speed, fast on-ramp. It's what developers expect. Or look at React, same thing. And in fact, first thing they promote is a code pen. So you click that code pen link, and within five seconds, you have your first Hello World React application. And you can, you know, interact. You can be interactive with it, obviously. It's a code pen, so you can start learning and changing. And all of a sudden, within seconds, you are building your first React application. And then there's Drupal. You know, we are still promoting the old download paradigm. We lead with a zip file. And with the zip file comes a long page of instructions on how to set up a local development environment, how to do things. It's prone. A lot of people just don't even get to a working Drupal site. It doesn't enable this kind of drive-by testing and learning. Now, I showed this to Tim Lennon uh, just the other day. And I'm happy to say that in the, in the last 24 hours, um, Tim actually fixed this. And Tim is the CTO of the Drupal Association, by the way. Um, and they, they put this on here, which is, you know, absolutely awesome. And, uh, you know, continues to show that the Drupal Association team is small but mighty. They're so reactive. They, you know, they, they move so fast. It, it's really amazing. So big shout out to them. So, you know, I'm glad we're making these changes. But it's also why I believe that things like Drupal Pod, which you got a little preview of in the project browser demo, as well as simply test me. They hold so much promise and I think we should find ways to promote these things more because they make it easy for people to test Drupal, to evaluate Drupal, to write their first lines of Drupal code. You know, uh, Let's remove all of the friction. Let's be focused on removing all of the friction. Let's set some goals around this and let's have a vision for how we can make that uh, evalu evaluator experience much better. Now, once we've attracted people, like once we've got people up and running on Drupal, obviously we need to turn them into contributors, right? And again, there's so many things that we do really, really well here. We have code sprints, we have mentorship programs, we have actually amazing test-driven development that so many organizations are, are jealous of. We have a contribution recognition system you know, we invented that and we still have the best system, uh, you know, in any open source project. So again, there's a lot of things that we do really well and that we do uniquely. But again, there's always things that we can do better. And one of the most important things is making our tools better, right? And because we don't want people to get stuck on tools. I mean, it's almost silly. And so earlier this year, in the Dries note, six months ago, um, you know, I announced the GitLab Acceleration Initiative. And you know the background here is that we have a lot of homegrown tools uh, to do collaboration and development, and we've been working on fully adopting GitLab because you know GitLab has better tools. Like it made sense to build our own tools, but now um, 
it makes more sense to um, you know, to leverage the great work that GitLab is doing. And so the goal is really to eliminate a lot of friction in the contribution process and a lot of friction with the current GitLab installation. Now, I won't read the bullets on the screen, but um, what's great is that the Drupal Association actually has been working really hard and they've made a lot of improvements. And so Tim Lennon from the Drupal Association um, is here to give an update on that progress. So let's take a look at the video of Tim. Hello, DrupalCon. Earlier this year, in the Dries Note at DrupalCon North America, we announced the GitLab Acceleration Initiative. Today, I'm here to bring you an update. First, a little background on how far we've come. Drupal.org has already switched from using a bespoke Git infrastructure to using a self-hosted instance of GitLab. This self-hosted GitLab instance now manages all of the nearly 40,000 repositories that are part of the Drupal project. Last year, we began integrating key features of GitLab into the existing Drupal.org issue queues, starting with GitLab merge requests. Since merge request integration launched in November of last year, over 10,000 merge requests have been opened across core and contributed modules. It's been heavily adopted and very successful. Nevertheless, as we saw in the last Dries note, there are still major points of friction. The Drupal.org account creation process is time consuming. It requires multiple confirmation and terms acceptance steps before you can make your first contribution. Drupal.org also only allows merge requests to be started after an issue has been created. So there's no way for a so-called drive-by contributor to suggest a quick code change. This is important because the majority of Drupal's contributors by volume only contribute one or two small changes per year. The easier we can make the contribution process for this long tail of casual contributors, the more easily we can capture their enthusiasm and grow them from casual contributors to more committed members of our community. CI is also still centrally managed with our bespoke Drupal CI system. This works well for ensuring that all of Core and Contrib are correctly tested against Drupal's system requirements, but moving this to GitLab CI will give us more introspection into the testing pipeline and also allow maintainers to configure their own custom pipelines, which unlocks new innovation like the JavaScript components I'll talk about in a moment. And finally, onboarding new contributors still requires learning a bespoke set of tools and a bespoke workflow, even though we now have merge requests. If we can make the contribution tools a more off-the-shelf experience, these contributors won't need as much onboarding, and they may more easily be able to integrate contributing back into their workflow at their day job. After all, if you use GitHub or GitLab for work, using an off-the-shelf GitLab instance for Drupal contribution should be much easier. That is why this initiative exists, to reduce friction and eliminate roadblocks by incrementally replacing key portions of our bespoke tooling with more features directly from GitLab. So what are we doing next? Firstly, we've started an audit of contributor workflows, gathering user stories to understand all the different ways the Drupal community works together so that we can ensure that each need is covered as we move more tools to GitLab. At the same time, we're in the discovery phase of building out an authentication and single sign-on system that will let you sign into Drupal.org and our GitLab instance in one click and create an account using your existing GitHub or GitLab.com credentials, or potentially even other social login providers. We're also working to enable more GitLab features in a phased rollout. The Decoupled Menus Initiative team has already been granted access to GitLab CI and pipelines, and are using it to publish Drupal's first JavaScript components to NPM. We're exploring how to open this to more contrib projects. This would mean that a module maintainer who wants to create new automation pipelines using third-party technologies that aren't part of Drupal's core environment can do so much more easily, accelerating the pace that, say, even more JavaScript components can be created, as just one example. It could also allow contributors to use tools like Drupal Rector to check code deprecations directly in their project CI system instead of running those tools locally. We're also working towards enabling GitLab pages so that module maintainers can publish developer and contributor specific documentation using that format. Our existing documentation system is great for collaborative wiki style editing and is still the tool of choice for writing user documentation guides. But when it comes to more highly technical documentation, GitLab pages will allow maintainers to use their choice of documentation tools and manage revisions directly in Git. And soon, we'll be looking for maintainers of contributed modules who want to opt in to using GitLab issues directly rather than Drupal.org issues. This will be a beta test to validate that the user stories we've captured have covered all the bases for contributed module contribution. 
When we're ready to announce the beta, we'll publish a blog post and open an issue where you can opt in with your project. Finally, one of the most crucial steps in this process, before we can enable GitLab issues for projects, we're looking for solutions to preserve perhaps the most important innovation of Drupal.org, our contribution recognition system, so that as we move projects to GitLab issues, we can still recognize the work of our contributors and measure the health of our community. So I hope you too share my enthusiasm for improving the tools that we collectively use to build Drupal. If you're interested in following the process or getting involved in the initiative, follow along in the GitLab channel on Drupal Slack. Thanks for your time, and I hope to bring you more updates as these features roll out. Awesome. I do share the enthusiasm, Tim. Thank you for your leadership and the hard work of the Drupal Association staff. Uh, all of this was accomplished by them. And I even have some, some better news, which is that the Drupal Association has raised additional money, and that money will be used to augment the engineering team with uh, a couple of contractors to accelerate the GitLab acceleration initiative. Now, that is great but we're still looking for an additional hundred thousand dollars so we can complete all of the gitlab uh, acceleration work so expect to see even more progress uh, by next DrupalCon. and if you're able to uh, financially support this initiative and make contribution a lot easier remove barriers for new contributors uh, please get in touch with heather uh, or anyone else at the drupal association so to wrap up this keynote this is the last slide um I wanted to say that when an open source project is working really well, it's a little bit like a heart. You know, on the one hand, we're attracting new users. On the other hand, the other part of the heart, if you will, it's about turning these new users into contributors. And I believe that if we execute uh, on all of the, the core initiatives, the product initiatives, if you will, then we'll make Drupal a more compelling solution for site builders and developers. And, and that should attract new users. You know, products win by being great products, right? So it's about making the product better. And the initiatives are the right initiatives. Um, you know, Drupal 9 and Drupal 10 are doing well. The strategic initiatives are making progress. We're hitting milestones. We're going to complete some of them soon. And then on the other hand, if we make it easier, uh, to test uh, Drupal, to evaluate Drupal, um, you know, with, with solutions like, you know, Drupal Pod and Simply Test Me, if we promote those a little bit more and we move away from the traditional download paradigm of a zip file, uh, I think that's really important to attracting uh, new people and showing them all of these new things that we've built. And then it's about removing, you know, friction in the contribution process, right? And so GitLab is really important uh, in that as well. And as you just saw, uh, GitLab uh, is making progress. We are eliminating uh, friction in the process and it's about to be accelerated. So all in all, you know, I'm very, you know, encouraged, I guess, about all of our progress. It, it feels really good. It's true that we have a slowdown in contribution, but I'm actually not worried about it because, there's good reasons uh, to explain uh, why, and I'm and I'm optimistic that we'll see sort of the next, um, you know, acceleration in the uh, Drupal uh, super cycle. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm hopeful that the growth in the agency, you know, them hiring new employees will translate in us having new contributors, um, and I'm hopeful that that some of these people that are joining the Drupal project now will turn out to be sort of the game changers, you know, like um, that they will jump in and that they will help do amazing things for Drupal and change our history. Um, and maybe one of them uh, is you, you know, one of them is you who are uh, watching this uh, very keynote or attending uh, DrupalCon. Uh, with that, I want to say thank you. Thanks for listening. Um, we're going to take a little bit of a break. There will be a demo, I, be I believe. And then in about you know 20 to 30 minutes or so at 2 p.m. Uh, Central European time, I'll be back for a Q&A with Heather Rocker. Uh, and we'll be um, here for 45 minutes so we can answer any question that you have. I've not been able to read any of the comments or questions in chat I was, as I was presenting, uh, but I'm sure we can get to you know some or all of them uh, in the Q&A se section. So thank you for watching. Uh, and enjoy the rest of your day and the rest of uh, DrupalCon.